All right. So welcome everybody to the kickoff uh, lecture of the HEAR seminar series <laughs> in the Austrian Academy of Sciences. I'm, I'm glad to welcome you here on this first day after a long holiday break for most of us. So happy new year, first of all, to you in the in the room and to you in the in the digital audience. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Rana Ösbal today. Uh, I would say long-term friend and collaboration partner since more than a decade now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, we know each other since um, our, let's say, early days of Bajin Hög and Chukurici Hög excavations in Western Turkey where we, our both teams uh, collaborated already in and tried to develop things like, you know, um, a chronological framework together and um, um, material studies together and all these kind of things in these early days before Western Anatolia became the, let's say, a kind of a hub in Neolithic archeology, span what it is today now. All right, Rana, Rana um, is, um, um, Associate assistant, associate professor at uh, at Koch University now, um, and her um, her biography is very interesting because she she has she has an anthropological background. So she studied anthropology uh, in a, in the American sense, which means archaeology and anthropology. Um, she did her um, um, her undergraduates in uh, in Turkey, but then her PhD at the Northwestern University in Illinois. She, uh, by, 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 uh, by the way, with uh, Gil Stein and Cynthia Robbins, who both are also well known here in the Institute. Um, she, um, she's combining theoretical models, anthropological theoretical models with archaeology with a focus on prehistory. Her expertise is the, let's say, the Near East in, the, in, the, in a quite broad sense. Um, she has excavated several sites in Turkey. Um, for example, she, is the co she was the co-director of the Barcin Hög excavations in, um, in northwestern Turkey or in Kurdu, or in, uh, she's also again now working again in, uh, in southeast Anatolia. So, and her, and her second most interest at the moment is, I would say, um, the neolithization, the, uh, the origins of early farming societies. So, this, so these kind of things and also, um, more theoretical background, and she's discussing also theoretical background when it comes to complex societies, early complex societies. So this is one part of her expertise. So this is one food, I would say. And the second is related with archaeological sciences and with kind of what we call today microarchaeology, what she developed very, very, very early, uh, already more than a decade ago uh, in Turkey. And she's also also developed um, a very impressive archaeological sciences uh, lab at the Koch University. So if you ever have the chance to visit her in Istanbul, please please use this opportunity. This is really quite impressive. And um, she will present today some of her most recent studies. She told me it's already submitted um, on milking metals and, and manual isotope-based results from 7th millennium in Northwest Turkey. So Rana, I'm very happy to welcome you. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. Uh, it really is an honor to be here at this amazing institute with all these facilities. Uh, when we talk about archaeology labs, usually in Turkey, it's a, uh, a room full of, you know, reference collections, and it's just very new. We're taking baby steps and trying to uh, establish archaeological sciences in an analytical sense and expand into uh, different methodologies. Uh, and it's been partly driven by uh, the rules where uh, the Ministry of Culture has imposed with regards to exportation of artifacts. Uh, so we're doing our best to uh, improve the techniques. And so it's, it's a real honor to be in a place where a lot of things are being done. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so as my title suggests, I'll be talking about um, some uh, dairy uh, and lipid residue results so, and also <clears throat> some animal herding strategies based on some isotopic results that uh, we have uh, been analyzing 
uh, particularly from the seventh millennium, Northwest Turkey, but I'll also go into later millennia uh, as well. This is how I do. No, right. Let me do this. Yeah. So, and the main site that I'll be talking about is Varjan Hayyut, and Barbara also mentioned it, uh, but again, uh, other sites around in the region as well. Uh, and uh, this region in Northwest Turkey uh, has become actually famous with the uh, infamous study uh, by Ebershed in 2008, where he um, showed that this was where um, dairying uh, had a lot of impact. Uh, is there a laser pointer? Here? No. Oh, if I move it around. Oh, okay. Uh, in this uh, area here, we can see the Northwest uh, Anatolian um, dairy um, concentrations with regards to the liquid residues that he was able to analyze with a large team of people uh, doing over 2,000 samples. Uh, and since then, we've done quite a bit of research as well. And indeed, this region uh, is very special with uh, the concentrations of uh, lipid residues that it's yielding. Uh, but there are some things that um, we are able to refine and look at some more details. For example, with the Ebershed study, uh, a date of 6,500 was given, but we don't really know what percentage come from the mid seventh millennium, whether they're from the later part of the seventh millennium, whether they're into the sixth millennium, what kind of vessels were used? Um, is there any way to refine this chronology and to really sort of begin to understand some of the uh, developmental steps in this process for this special uh, region? Uh, so these are some of the questions that um, uh, I hope to explore together with uh, colleagues uh, that have been uh, working with us. Uh, but first, before I go into all these details, I need to sort of introduce to you um, some of these things. So the, the two sites that uh, particularly were important to Evershed's work were Kutukekna uh, and Pandi, shown here. Um, uh, and they probably go around to about 6,300. Them here in purple. We already had a few other sites excavated there that hadn't been uh, uh, sampled by that team, uh, and new sites were excavated since then. New and larger trade going back to 6,600 uh, is where we have a, a well stratified um, uh, archaeological uh, layering uh, and also uh, lots of uh, different uh, data on the ceramics. Uh, the excavations took place between 2007 and 2015 by the Netherlands Institute in Turkey, uh, with permission, of course, from the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. Uh, and they were directed by Fulke Garrison and Mattel. Uh, and the area, I suppose, was not um, wide, I mean, it was a narrow area, but we did go down uh, quite deep, reaching about five meters, giving us a very good uh, sort of uh, stratigraphic sequence. Uh, and uh, in addition to Neolithic levels, I don't know if you can see it there, but we have uh, Calcolithic Bronze Age levels and later levels, and the Neolithic levels uh, are divided into uh, seven subcategories. Uh, and we have over 85 radiocarbon dates to really pinpoint this uh, chronological sequence to uh, refine the kinds of things that, uh, uh, the kind of changes that we see, both with ceramic styles and with the stratigraphy as well. So the Calcolithic and the Bronze Age are also levels that I'll talk about a little bit later at the end. So I'll start with the Neolithic sequence. It takes us into the first half of the, uh, the seventh millennium down to 6,600 or perhaps slightly there before. Uh, and this is a time when Neolithic uh, groups are uh, leaving the core regions of the Neolithic uh, and expanding into territories in the north and the northwest, uh, some going by sea uh, and of course some taking overland routes. And with them, they're bringing, as we don't have wild progenitors to these uh, uh, crops, to these animal species, domesticated animals, they're bringing their packages with them. Uh, there's cattle, sheep, and goats, there's cereals and pulses, uh, and also a reliance on secondary products. Here are some examples of uh, the kinds of economic plants that have been analyzed by Rena Balger, 
and by Alfred Gallick here in Vienna, who analyzed the animal bones. We know that uh, sheep uh, and cattle are important, cattle by weight, sheep by count, but we do have goats as well. Pigs are very rare, uh, and the few pigs that were found that were measured appear to be in the wild range. So these are uh, ruminant farmers, if you will, herders taking their farms out, which makes sense because they do also do dairying as well. Uh, and um, uh, basically this overland route that begins perhaps in central Anatolia, but perhaps even further in, in northern Mesopotamia in the Levant takes a longer route across Europe, uh, some of them perhaps going overland, perhaps partly over the Black Sea, some of them going into the southern uh, route and uh, really expanding into Europe, uh, if you will, uh, and bringing with them the package of uh, goods that is part of the Neolithic. Uh, and we know from DNA evidence that, uh, and the Barjan who was very influential with regards to uh, the DNA for the Anatolian Neolithic because it was very well preserved. And in fact, here in the recent publication, uh, you can see uh, actually large and listed. It does overlap with later uh, groups here in Germany and whatnot for Albuquerque groups. Um, there's also lots of uh, interesting ideas about uh, climate and how that would have affected the spread of these groups from these more sort of core uh, areas and into uh, the Balkans and beyond. And these are issues I'd like to return to as we sort of finish and do the conclusions of the paper and perhaps with questions as well. So I'd like to first introduce you the site and thereafter provide you some of the analyses that were done uh, and uh, 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 you know, sort of try to wrap up things thereafter. So I'll start with uh, our earliest levels, that's 6E here, and you can, see, you can follow it through over here where you can see the actual levels, where we have a few houses that were excavated, only two, uh, these were quite far down in the excavation. And I don't know if you can see, but the white sort of background areas where we were able to go down to uh, the lowest levels. And beneath this, uh, we reached areas where there was virgin soil. So this is the very first beginners, the very first pioneers that are coming into this region to settle here. Uh, and these two houses uh, were built with large post holes. Uh, and you can see them here where they placed gigantic posts and I say gigantic because they're 25 to 45 centimeters across. Uh, and they, because they uh, are quite heavy, they go down 50 to 80 centimeters. So they're uh, placing these posts. This is something that uh, while we do know about wood timber architecture from places, you know, like Tafelik or something where they have some components that might've been wood, something like this is not something that we are aware of uh, for, uh, many other regions, in fact, uh, and um, here you can see some of the postal uh, choice too, so you can actually get an image of how this would have worked. And uh, associated with, uh, sorry, uh, in this minimum area, associated with this level, we are also finding a large percentage of stones that have been somehow fire cracked, uh, and through uh, research with our ceramics experts, Laura and Stisson, uh, we came to the conclusion that these may have been uh, somehow related to hot rock cooking. So the ceramics in this level are very rare. We have per cubic meter, only 14 shards. So uh, they're basically doing some sort of indirect firing. In addition, this is one lot, for example, lots of fired stones, some animal bones, no ceramics in this one. Uh, and you can see how they've been sort of reddened, sometimes uh, with smoke on them. Uh, and they would have been sort of indirectly heating the stones elsewhere and then using perhaps the pots themselves or perhaps other sort of uh, areas uh, to be able to uh, heat and cook uh, their food. Uh, so this is kind of the beginning that we're finding. And in fact, uh, from Chapelle, they're using the same sort of technology with the clay balls, which you might be familiar with. Again, indirectly heating them and placing them 
uh, elsewhere. And when we look at the quantity of fire uh, stones over time, uh, our earliest level, 6E, uh, from 6,600 has the highest numbers uh, and it goes uh, diminishes through time. So, uh, and with this, at the same time, we see an increase of ceramics. Uh, so this is looking at micro ceramics that are less than one centimeters. And the reason why this is selected is that because we have very accurate uh, measurements for the liters and we can see exactly the increase of ceramics through time. It's very few uh, per liter in the earliest level, but increases incrementally through time. Just to take a look at the pottery, it's oftentimes very thick walled vessels that are whole melt vessels. Uh, so they tend to be uh, made with a schist temper. Uh, and while they would have been um, perhaps resistant to the heat, they would not have been efficient cooking vessels. They would have been, uh, they wouldn't have conducted the heat in an efficient way, maybe use more fuel than necessary. And uh, they, were, they were clearly used in conjunction with other techniques like these rock techniques. Uh, and you can see how friable uh, they are. Uh, and there are very few of them. Comparing this very early level with a century later, moving up to 61, uh, sorry, this should be 61, moving up to uh, uh, 6,500, we have basically in the same area, a series of uh, houses, this time uh, four of them, uh, alternating small and large houses, as you can see here. Uh, with, again, they're using these big posts, but only for the gable roof in the center. You can maybe see here, these are the big posts, but it's actually switched from this laborsome uh, project of making a post hole uh, and placing each of these posts separately from that to doing what we know across uh, most of Europe, where instead they place uh, a ditch and the posts go inside. So they sort of devised new construction methodologies for their architecture. And you can see this is a slice through one of them where each of the posts are determined. Uh, this has been studied extensively by Elisha van den Bos, who was doing the architecture and stratigraphy as part of the project. And you can see that they're much smaller in size as well, with the exception of the central coast. And for the first time, we're beginning to get uh, what we can call uh, very clear connections with uh, other Anatolian sites. For example, structure 19, right here, this large structure, uh, has a red floor, which is something we know from many other Anatolian sites. Uh, and here, after the rain, I don't know if you can see, but it became better. Uh, and again, uh, you can see that the red is appearing underneath this sort of brown layer above it. And like uh, other signs, we're finding platforms in the smaller room that are made with beads. And also features like goat horns and cattle horns, subfloor cattle horns, which kind of remind us of uh, things that we know where they are located from places like Chatahui, where these are integrated within the architecture. So not in the same elaborate sense, but we're finding similar kind of symbolic things within the site as well. And another thing that shows that connections with other sites was increasing is just looking at the obsidian. In level 6E, this is a percentage that you can see here on the left, uh, it's about 1%. It's hardly any obsidian. And obsidian is a good indicator of contacts, of, of connections, because you need to have these networks, access to these networks. Uh, but through time, as we uh, go on, you can see it increases up to over a quarter of the uh, total lithics uh, that are available, total shipstone. So uh, in the beginning, they were not as connected. And in 61, the ceramics are also changing. We're getting thin walled ceramics that are very heat conductive, uh, that enable it to be directly placed on the fire. This is extensively been studied by Lauren Sisson, our ceramicist who has also uh, looked at the uh, tempering agents in them. And if they switch from the schist to calcite, which is uh, conducting uh, the heat in a very efficient way, 
uh, and the thin walls are also contributing to this. And you can see here the inside of the shirt that's been that has very clear uh, some residue analysis on the inside of it as well, or that can be analyzed uh, for uh, residues. Although, of course, I should mention we always clean the outside surfaces so we go right into the actual pores of the, uh, the in inner parts of the vessels. And then my 6C, uh, staining to perhaps around 6,300. And by the way, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, so this is where we would be getting to uh, kind of the anal analysis that was done by the, by the Evershed study uh, of 2008. These were the ceramics we knew, and it's before the, the earlier levels are, are, are newly discovered at Barjanhuik and nearby sites. Um, and we had, by the way, no radiocarbon dates at all uh, at the time. It was just sort of a random date, the middle of the seventh millennium. Now we know that uh, at least in this region, we have dates that are going back to the early part, the first half of the seventh millennium as well. For example. But they're, they're, they're darker, they become sort of S profiles. This is sort of the archaic, so called archaic, if you said that perhaps. Uh, and you know, examples with the typical boxes that you see here. And then in the next phase, dating to after 6,200, we have dark, darker wares. Uh, they're not as maybe well-made, uh, but they're still very well burnished. Uh, and uh, they tend to have also these log handles, which I'd like to talk about. So let's uh, talk about the uh, sample preparation uh, protocols and the kind of analyses that were done here. Uh, the analyses were started at the same time that the Barjanhuik excavations started in 2007 and were undertaken by Hadi Özbal together with Ayla Türkeku uh, and also Lauren Sisson, the ceramicist, was uh, involved with part of them and um, were conducted basically for a, a decade, actually. And actually, um, Hadi Özbal sh should have been the person here explaining uh, all the, the results here to you, but I uh, had uh, a stroke in 2017 and the analyses uh, simply came to a halt. And we were very fortunate to have Adria Brunel Bartens uh, come as a postdoc fellow in, I think, 2021 uh, to the Koch uh, University. Uh, and he was able to go through and compile all this data uh, and really uh, bring the story. Uh, to its current form. So I'm very thankful to him uh, and all the research that he's done. And uh, in any case, uh, a lot of them were done with the chloroform methanol extraction techniques, so the total lipid extract, uh, and a lot of them, uh, I mean, a few of them thereafter were uh, with this acid hydration uh, method. Uh, so, and a few of them were also combined as well, uh, making a data set of 805, just for the Neolithic, uh, we also have later levels that were analyzed, so it's more than a thousand for a single site uh, of uh, analysis, uh, really trying to go level by level. And since we have radiocarbon dates and exact stratigraphic uh, sequencing, we can really begin to answer some of these things that uh, wasn't able to be done uh, back in 2008. Here's Andrea explaining to the students, and this is a uh, setup that we have the extractions uh, in our laboratory for the lipid residues. Uh, and we take usually uh, one gram of pottery uh, and use one of the methods. Uh, and then it's uh, subject to the GCFID. Uh, uh, after preliminary inter interpretation, uh, they're uh, either negative and if they're positive, we uh, subject them to the GCCIRMS. Uh, while Turkey, uh, doesn't have a lot of instrumentation. This is one field where we've been strong given its links with food chemistry. There's national laboratories and people willing to collaborate. Uh, and this has been a uh, wonderful collaboration. They've, they've helped with trying to work this out. Unfortunately, many of the samples I talk about here today were not analyzed by the GCMS because there was no access at the time. But I'm happy to report that we do have one now in our lab. And so from now on, we're able to look for different biomarkers that. Uh, we have not been able to do for this data set, but at least we have isotopic data on a number of samples to be able to actually uh, discuss these things in uh, a, a sense that uh, really able, is able to link them to the kind of residues. So what I'd like to do after I've given you the background is to uh, talk about 
the levels here in three main levels of two centuries each, 6,600 to 6,400, and then the middle period and the late period that you can see dividing them up to make them sort of more compatible uh, to put into different categories. Uh, and you can see the number of samples analyzed for each. And I'll be talking about the Calpolithic levels later briefly, where we also have 168 samples that were done. And we found among them different types of, uh, obviously, animal pets, uh, you know, dairy, uh, eating biomarkers with uh, keto, uh, and different types of uh, waxes that uh, are among many of the things that have been discovered uh, among the uh, sampled selection. And when we look at preservation rates by vessel part, it's usually the upper parts of the vessels that were preserved uh, and the body also had a fair amount and was much less for the base and the lower parts. And this is for all the different uh, periods combined, basically, of the Neolithic. And when we look at their thicknesses, we can see that uh, the thinner vessels, oops, sorry, excuse me, uh, the thinner vessels tend to have uh, more preservation rates than the thicker vessels, sorry, this is here, the thicker vessels and the ones with the smaller diameters. These were Trend, uh, trends that we can see because the data set is large, because we're able to look at a great range of data. And for each shirt, Lauren Sisson was able to uh, draw and illustrate and try to see exactly which part and how the vessel would have been, uh, what size it would have been. So we have all this information as well, making it an excellent data set. Uh, and uh, there are uh, well-preserved uh, uh, tags or triacyl glycerols that you can see here, uh, where we can somehow uh, in the beginning sorry, try to identify if there are um, uh, milk residues, although obviously we need the isotopic data. But here are the isotopic results for all periods, looking at the Neolithic and the Calcolithic, uh, and you can see that there is a great range here. Uh, in what we would call the ruminant dairy fat area. Uh, and here we have uh, the, the pig fats. But mind you, this also includes the calcolithic levels where we begin to see uh, pigs as part of the assemblage as well. Uh, and when we look only at the Neolithic levels for the early phase, middle phase, and the late phase, we have um, uh, much, much fewer uh, in terms of the actual non-ruminant fats, the actual pig fats are, are much produced. And again, you can see that for the earliest phase, the middle phase and the late phase, there are 58, 55, and 64% uh, dairy fats respectively. So we have a very large percentage from the beginning onward. It's maybe easier to see these percentages in this format. But because I've actually actually gone through and given you the background between 6E, if you recall, the very earliest levels where they're making the big post holes and the ceramics are rare, and the next phase, I'd like to also show you that in 6E, the uh, dairy percent is also very high. We have no ruminant fats there, uh, but I mean, not we have no non-ruminant fats there, but we have uh, a very large percent, more than half the residues already in this very beginning stage, when they don't really even use ceramics, they are still uh, using uh, milk. And so these people, when they arrived in this region, already had uh, a knowledge and a good ability to be able to herd their, their flocks and, and ex obtain the, the dairy from them. Uh, of course, the reason why these are put together is because the sample data sets are very small. We have very few shirts from this phase. So it works much nicer uh, in the larger picture to put them together. And now I'd like to um, talk about the different types of ceramics, because we are able to do this given the sample sizes. What kinds of ceramics do we see? Uh, do they change? Which ones have milk? Which ones don't? These are important questions that this data set can allow us to answer. So here we have uh, at the bottom closed vessels, and the purples and the yellows, and in the blues open vessels, and in the greens we have the different kinds of forms, like special forms like these boxes that you may have seen. 
But because it's simpler and there's not enough time for everyone to absorb all that data, it's much easier to see it here, where I combine the bowls uh, and sort of cups in some cases with indeterminates. And the reason why you have lots of indeterminates, especially in the early phase over here, is because, as I said, um, we have very few ceramics for our earliest levels, and we couldn't always take rim shirts or shirts that were diagnostic. We took lots of body shirts for those phases simply because of, you know, otherwise we couldn't analyze anything. So this is adding to that and much less in later phases. You can see lug pods and pots. And I think you can notice that there is an increase in lug pods through time. This is something we see across the region uh, where pots begin to have lugs instead of having just whole mouse chains and the special vessels are at the top. So what I'd like to do now is actually begin to talk about the kinds of vessels that are there, including, for example, uh, bowls uh, first, and see, do they have lipids? Are they milk lipids or what are they, basically, to sort of understand um, if there are special vessels already being used for dairying and milk production. And indeed, the milk is, for the early, middle, and the late periods, is about 70 to 80%. Even though there's only five in the early period, uh, vessels that were identi that had identifiable residues. Uh, so three of them, uh, oh, sorry, four of them uh, were already, uh, were, were, were milk residues here in the beginning. Uh, and, and again, here in the middle phases and here in the late phases as well. Uh, and 61% of the triethylglycerols uh, here uh, are from bowls in the middle phase, even though it's only 20% of the shapes. Uh, so there's lots of uh, rich fats in bowls uh, that we're finding from the earliest levels onwards. You can see what these vessels would have looked like, these bowls, and in the middle period, where they begin to be a little more S-shaped as profiles. Uh, and uh, when we look at them close up, we can see that there is some interior smudging uh, here and exterior smudging as well on these vessels. And one hypothesis that we can propose is that uh, perhaps this was vessels to make yogurt in. Even today, open vessels are used across Anatolia and beyond, I think, to be able to set yogurt. It's first heated to about 85 to 90 degrees and then let to sit uh, to make sort of uh, at 40 degrees to allow it to set. Uh, and um, since the percentages are high, uh, these could potentially have been used for uh, these purposes. So, uh, and, and I should also mention, as I did, that the lipid concentrations are, uh, are above average with high preservation rates as well for these bowls. And when we move on to pots and lugged pots, we also see interesting patterns. And I'd like to also briefly talk about this. So we have uh, uh, pots and lugged pots in here show you this slide, you can see without lug or whole mouth pods, when you begin to have in the early period, two lugs appearing in small numbers. Uh, thereafter, uh, we have in the middle phase, again, more uh, two lugged pots that continue. But by the later phase, we begin to have pots that have four lugs. We can't read it, but there's pots that have four lugs here uh, at, uh, in the later phase. Uh, that become very popular. This is the early phase where we have the two love pots. And the results that we have for them. Yes, they were used for milk, quite a large percent, but they were also cooking pots for just meats, uh, for, for animal fats, for ruminant animal fats, and small percentages of non-ruminant animal fats, adipose fats as well. In the middle period, we actually begin to see, and here you can see some of these vessel examples with the two lugs that I mentioned. And here, of course, in the previous slide, uh, some with lugs as well. But they begin to increase, as you can all from the statistics. Uh, and we also have, here's the bottom of one, where you can see the burning at the bottom. These are clearly used on an open uh, uh, fire. Uh, we have at least uh, one of these middle uh, period um, two lug pots had uh, 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 biomarkers for mid-chain ketones, which is a 
signal for actually uh, for, for being heated at high temperatures. So these were also cooking pots uh, and their recipes included milk as well. 38% uh, milk in, it, in this phase. And now I'd like to move on to the later phase where we have uh, for the first time, four log pots. These four legged pots usually are pierced so that they can be suspended from something above so that you can actually use it uh, to sort of uh, agitate the uh, contents a little bit. And these are sort of examples of two log pots. And here are a few examples from the late period of these four log pots uh, where you can see uh, the piercing uh, in this one too, uh, where um, they would have been perfect for being suspended. And when we look at the difference between the two log and the four log pots, we can see that there is a huge increase in the quantity of milk lipids for the first time. So we're having, uh, yes, they're still being used as cooking vessels, but we have for the first time something that uh, is becoming sort of a vessel to be able to make uh, sort of dairy products in. And we do know if you agitate milk, uh, the actual the membranes of the, uh, the cells uh, sort of begin to curdle together. And that's how you make butter. Uh, and that's how you make other sort of products of iron and different things when you shake it together. Uh, and this would have been necessary for these farmers, for them to be able to digest, obviously, this milk. It needed to be processed in some way. And at this point, these four log pots are becoming uh, invented and becoming common, and they also move on with these farmers into Europe and beyond. Here are some photos to show you, these aren't suspended necessarily, but how uh, people would have been uh, using sort of milk products and, and agitating them. Uh, and this is a photo from Turkey where they're making iron, this buttermilk drink, by shaking um, these, uh, the milk inside and agitating it. So uh, here we have, I think, the first and the earliest evidence for uh, actual vessels that clearly would have been connected to milk. Yes, they still would have been used as cooking pots. We have lots of ruminant fats in it as well, but clearly uh, they would have used, been used for milk. And when we look at the actual, here's a, a review of all the different periods, uh, dividing the late period into the four and the two log pots and the no log pots, we can see that when we look at the total fat amount, we can see sort of uh, 741 micrograms of lipids coming from one gram of, of ceramic from dairy products in these four-legged pots. And so, and this compares with much lower quantities for ruminant adipose fats and non-ruminant adipose fats. So 76% uh, uh, is uh, a very high number. Uh, and so we can actually argue convincingly that four legged pots were more in contact with milk based fatty rich substances. So, in addition to sort of this study, I'd like to also talk about the bronze, I mean, the calcolithic, and a little bit about the bronze ages uh, at Bargen Reef. We have no um, residue and analysis for the bronze age, although we do, but no results. Uh, but the residue results for the calcolithic. Uh, for two different phases of the calcolithic, uh, and I'll also talk about some collagen uh, extraction uh, uh, work that was done, uh, and uh, looking at carbon and nitrogen isotopes, especially also including the Bronze Age as well. So we have a middle calcolithic component dating to the fifth millennium, and a late calcolithic component dating to the fourth millennium, late levels high day, and 5b. Uh, and in the middle Calcolithic, it's a uh, jumble of silos. Uh, this is a time when there would have been, uh, we believe, um, climatic uh, differences in the climate, that it would have been more arid, we think. There's very few signs that we know of, uh, and perhaps these are silos where people uh, would have uh, kept their grain. Uh, and in the late Calcolithic, we have uh, a ditch system with some architecture and ovens and things like this. Uh, and these were very ephemeral uh, levels and I can't really go into detail <laughs> here about them. But what we do have for both of these levels is the appearance of uh, basically pig or non-ruminant fats uh, coming into the question. Uh, and the studies 
done by Alfred Ballot has been able to show by um, weight the pig here uh, and by count uh, the pig over here. So uh, th this is something that's now part of the assemblage. Uh, and indeed, when we look at the liquid residue results, we can see that dairying is not really at the top of their uh, diet anymore. Uh, those people all moved on into, into Europe uh, and said, we see sort of an equal distribution, especially for the late calculus of different types of uh, uh, nutritional products of you know, pigs and uh, different pork and uh, different things that they were actually uh, eating at the time. And when we compare all the Neolithic phases here where the milk is much higher to the calcolithic, middle and late calcolithic deposits, you can see the big change that has taken place. And now I'd like to switch gears and talk about the um, carbon and nitrogen isotopes. Uh, this is something very new that we started. Uh, as, as you know, the lipid residues have been going on uh, for a, a long time now, but um, this, this is something that uh, uh, we were sort of forced to do uh, and there's more analysis that we're hoping we can accomplish uh, given the uh, regulations that have changed with regards to exporting artifacts. And so uh, we have to find ways and uh, we've, we've created an extraction facility and we're working again in collaboration with the national facility to be able to get the analyses done for the you know, bone collagen. Uh, and uh, we uh, have a number of studies, this one, the 2020 study by Bud et al. Uh, is one that's published. And these were taken out, the, the, the samples here were taken out, uh, I think in 2012 or 13, when the, the rules were still flexible enough to be able to allow for their transport abroad. And they were done in Oxford. Uh, thereafter, uh, in 2021, uh, together with Benjamin Irvine, uh, I was able to participate in the study at Coach University where we just set up the facility looking primarily at the Calcolithic and the early Bronze Age uh, animal bones and trying to extract collagen. So here we have mostly the skull animal, uh, here we have human. And then I continued, uh, some of these were Neolithic, six of them were Neolithic here, with this study uh, and added some more human bones uh, and more sheep, goat, and cattle, and a few more wild um, samples as well, just to see how this compares. And here you can see all the periods uh, of the uh, delta nitrogen 15 uh, and the, the, the carbon 13 values for, for, for all periods together. Uh, and the humans are at the top with the infants uh, further up, and I won't be talking about them today. And the uh, environmental signature down here with the salad and the zeal, the deer and the rabbit and whatnot. We have a few pigs. These are all, of course, calcolithic. We have the sheep and the goat. And we have the cattle. And what's interesting that you'll notice with the cattle is that there's a huge spread. And there's one crane that seems to have come from somewhere very far uh, north. Uh, and I checked their routes, I think from Russia or Estonia or somewhere like that, because it's a very different signature. But what you can notice here with the, uh, the cattle is that there's an enormous spread for all these periods. And usually, sort of minus 18, uh, for the delta part of 13, is considered sort of a threshold for C3 and C4 plants. Uh, and uh, there's a clear, distinct group that's on this side that seems to have been fed on C4 plants, or at least had part of its diet with, with C4 plants. Uh, and this would have been more sort of a uh, steppe environment, either somehow uh, an arid landscape or some salinity affecting a few per mil uh, in this respect, uh, as opposed to, and we don't have any value over minus 20 feet, but as opposed to more, um, uh, you know, shady environments of these where the grasses uh, were uh, providing more C3 uh, uh, nutrients. And uh, when we do look actually at the lipid residue data again uh, and look at this contrast that we see, we can see in fact that there are quite a few uh, that are sort of maybe about minus 23 could be a, a line, there's no official threshold, but there's a lot of dairy products that, uh, especially here the dairy, that are sort of uh, you know, suggesting that they 
coming from are coming from sort of C4 sources. So these towels, some of these towels were being uh, placed into the environment in, in, in zones that would have allowed them to be eating sort of C4 uh, grasses somehow. And that this is being reflected within the actual lipid residue result as well. Uh, and this is an important uh, sort of thing and it sort of explains the situation. Uh, and I think what's important to recognize is also uh, that uh, it suggests that the people here were uh, from, and, and I, I maybe it's good if I go through just the, uh, the Neolithic only, so that the other one was uh, all periods. So the Neolithic only also includes uh, at least three individuals and there's only, uh, I think there's only 21 cattle that have been analyzed in total. Three individuals also showing this signature. And that's 14.3% that you can see here. And there's also a few individuals that are very, very high with regards to their uh, nitrogen values as well. And this could be evidence for uh, being uh, herded or, um, uh, in, in manure fields or um, uh, somehow in a different environment as well. Uh, and you can see that the uh, sheep, and this is some of the sheep are also high, but they seem to cluster much neater than the cattle, um, uh, uh, sheep angle, I should say, than the cattle. And when we look at the different periods that I've been talking about, the early, the middle, and the late, we see that we have them from the very earliest levels onwards. These people were maximizing their herding environments and making sure, uh, maybe for dairy, to get uh, you know, their herds into all different territories, perhaps to be able to exploit the environment in the most effective way in order to be able to uh, uh, have their, their milk, <laughs> basically. Uh, so they're very knowledgeable about this already from the very the, the, the first half of the seventh millennium when they've already arrived here and are still you know, dealing with trying to make houses in ways that are sustainable and, and trying to get their ceramics uh, set up that they were already doing in terms of their herding and in terms of uh, their um, animal husbandry. I think this suggests that there is uh, uh, you know, the necessity to uh, use the landscape in its maximum sense. Looking at the early, middle, and the late phases, I've shown you this already, but you can see, again, uh, values. I don't know if you can see the blue, but um, you can see that some of them are uh, falling within the ranges that would be considered uh, coming from dairy products that were from cows that were feeding on C4 products potentially. And when we look at the Calcolithic in the early Bronze Age, we can see an increase here. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually most of these are from the early Bronze Age. And this is also a period where uh, they would have maybe been using the same strategies. We don't have any lipid residue results and I can't show you uh, the, the milk percentages here, uh, but in general, the same strategy seems to have worked and continued on into Later periods, So with that, I'd like to sort of wrap up and conclude this discussion. So uh, with regards to the lipids, we've really been able to um, uh, sort of go through the data that uh, was uh, already sort of uh, pinpointed as being important for this region uh, with one specific site with plenty of radiocarbon dates and good stratigraphy and really uh, taking the care to make sure we understand the vessel shapes in order to be able to see this evolution of the, uh, uh, the dairying uh, in this region. Uh, and we can say that bowls were already from the beginning onwards specialized uh, vessels for uh, dedicated for milk. Um, in the late period, we, all, we all also can say with some certainty that these four legged pots would have been uh, used also for cooking ruminant plants, but also milk products for sure, given their high preservation rates uh, with uh, dairy. Uh, and when we look at the collagen-based data, we can see that they had differing strategies, especially for cattle, uh, that they had uh, you know, forest areas, open meadow systems perhaps, perhaps manured fields, uh, and or the, the, the cattle was receiving uh, consistently different kinds of fodder, but it's it's a very varied uh, picture that we're getting. Uh, so there were 
uh, related to probably maximizing landscape use. Perhaps there was competing herds and herders at the same time, starting from the earliest levels of the Neolithic. So here you can see a farmer uh, taking the cows out into uh, pastures. Uh, and with that, I'd like to sort of conclude by uh, bringing back some of the questions we asked in the beginning. So we know that there are groups going from uh, this region and, uh, and I think, you know, it's nice to be able to sort of bring some uh, refinement to some of these earlier studies, but uh, there's been lots of uh, ideas uh, about part of the Northern territories, especially uh, with regards to climate and climatic situations. And we see that there's higher concentrations of milk uh, in the Northern latitudes of the Northern Balkans, for example, uh, as opposed to the South. And obviously in Greece, it's a, a very different story. Uh, and, uh, and it's true that the animals would have had to adjust to these new environments uh, in terms of thermal regulation, in terms of length of day, in terms of the uh, cold uh, in these environments and not having enough fodder or food in winter months. So there's lots of adjustment that has to take place in short periods of time, given the kind of immense uh, transitions that are happening uh, in this period. Uh, but we also have to remember that um, there are differences from the Neolithic core, not necessarily from the Marmara region, but uh, from, beyond, from somewhere we don't know. Uh, these people came with, these knowledge, with this knowledge already to this region. So there are regions uh, within the core of the Neolithic, within central Anatolia perhaps, or perhaps even the Levant that were practicing this uh, to begin with. So uh, we can also add to this list uh, that is convincing with regards to climate, but we can also add cultural factors, traditions, uh, and different things that people are bringing with them uh, as they move towards uh, Europe. Uh, and we know they are because the DNA is showing that. So uh, these are things that we need to consider. And there are many other factors as well uh, that we can maybe discuss uh, with the questions uh, later. But this is basically what I wanted to say. And thank you for inviting me.